I'm Pamela Nash, and with me is John Gann, founder of DC Shorts Film Festival and author of Behind the Screens. John, <laughs> good afternoon. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. I, this is so good to have you come talk to us. One thing that I don't think a lot of people realize, but you're a native Washingtonian. I am. And when we meet somebody like you that's got a lot of talent in a lot of different areas, a lot of creative chops, they leave, they go to LA, they go to New York. Right. You never see them again. But you decided to stay here, so tell us a little bit about why you decided to stay. Uh, it's home. I mean, it's, it's where I was born and raised. I, I never really thought about leaving. I mean, I get offers all the time. I just, I don't know, I, my feeling is DC has such a vibrant creative community. I mean, it's a huge creative community. Theater, film, art, everything, writing. And why not stay here and be part of that exciting turn of events as it happens? You know, 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to move back downtown before the Renaissance began. I kind of sensed it was going to happen. I'm like, I'm moving there, because that's where it's going to be. Um, and I had no regrets. It's been fantastic. And it's amazing to see how the city has thrived since then and really grown. And this is not like just lip service, like a lot of people talk about their hometown. Like, you're really investing. You were thinking about running for city council. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're involved with what's going on in the Lincoln Theater. And I want to ask you a little bit about that. What, sure. What's the status of Lincoln Theater, and why should like, the film community care? Well, the Lincoln Theater, as everyone has, has had a really you know, storied history, um, the city bought the building years ago, uh, sort of to save it from itself. Uh, the Arts Commission has kind of sat on it for a while. They finally put an RFP out a few months ago mm -hmm. and are looking for, and are, should be very soon, uh, awarding a contract to someone to run new programming at the, the Lincoln. My feeling is the city's sitting on an incredible piece of property in one of the most vibrant neighborhoods in town. Uh, and I think that if they continue to do single, if they keep it as a single venue, it's just going to fail. We have enough music halls in town. The theater is both too big and too small. The mm -hmm. house is too big. 1,400 seats is a lot of seats to fill. And the backstage is too small for most companies to use. So you can't get touring Broadway productions. You can't get some big shows in there. Um, and because the building is historic and has this community sense of history to it in which people are so attached to that they're afraid that even changing the paint color is going to change everything. It's a real difficult political maneuver. Um, you know, I, I put out there before that I, my feeling is, again, they're sitting on a great piece of property. No one needs another 1400 seat theater in this town. Why not, you know, first of all, sell out the air rights, you know, the, they could put condos on top of that, which would pay for everything on the inside, and then turn to some sort of arts center in which there was a permanent movie theater, a small one, maybe 150 seats, but something that people could use for screenings. Um, lots of affordable and accessible rehearsal space and black box theater space, uh, dance studios, that type of thing. Uh, because there's so many community groups, so many theater groups, arts groups that really need a space. The city could make an incredible art center if they really wanted to. I just think that they're so tied by this history that they're afraid to move forward. How would you recommend that like, the local film community could help get involved? Well, it, if, just by attending any event that's there. You know, um, fewer and fewer film. I believe that with the RFP coming out and with the new management company, I think there's going to be fewer and fewer films there. I know for a while the city tried to work with Landmark and they put a uh, girl with a tattoo there. Th that played for a little bit. But the, the facility it doesn't work very well for film. It's got a horrible sound system and it wasn't made for that to begin with. Right. Um, but just support the center as much as you can so that hopefully more things will come, et cetera. Well, speaking of supporting the film community, you're in your 10th year now with DC Shorts. Yes. Which is pretty remarkable. Uh, <laughs> you're telling <How>? me. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you decide you're going to just launch a film festival? <laughs> oh, that's a good story. Um, in 2000, 2001, I had a short film that played about 50 festivals around the world. And I took a year and a half off, and I literally traveled around the world to festivals and was really disheartened at how film festivals treated filmmakers, especially m like myself who made short content. Um, and the festivals to me seemed to be about money and parties and sponsors, and then at the bottom of this V were filmmakers and films. Um, and if you made short films, you were just completely out of the loop. Uh, I had been to one festival that was a first year event. It was in Ashland, Oregon. They didn't know what they were doing. So it was all about filmmakers and films. And I was like, that's incredible. So I, when I came back to DC, I, through a lot of interesting circumstances, I, I had access to a small 100 seat black box theater. 
and I called a friend and said, we're going to start a film festival for short films because there's nothing in town about short films. Um, and that's what I knew and that I had met, you know, hundreds of short filmmakers uh, throughout the year. So I called most of them up and said, send me some product and we'll figure it out. And the first season was, you know, I think we did 33 films and three shows and I had no idea what we were doing. I was paying it out, for, out of my checkbook, just praying that we would sell some tickets so you know, I wouldn't lose my shirt. Um, and we ended up selling, overselling all the shows. It was lines around the corner. We had to cram more seats into the theater, breaking every fire code in DC. But it was well worth it. And it, that just, it's grown. So this year will be our 10th year. We're expecting an audience of more than 10,000 people. Uh, we're going to show the largest collection of Russian short films to ever be screened in America. Um, and hopefully about 150 films from 30 countries. That's kind of what we're going for. And something else I've noticed is it's not just like a once a year festival and then see you later. You do events and programs the rest of the year right. too. Right. Well, we, so we do, we do screening programs a few times throughout the year. Last year we started something new called Speakeasy Shorts in association with Speakeasy DC, the largest storytelling group in town. Uh, and it was a huge success. We paired eight storytellers with eight film teams who had a week to make films based on those stories. This year we're going to expand it to hopefully 16 teams. But that was, that was fantastic. We always do a midwinter event. This year was called Wins. It was award-winning film from the past that we've shown, as well as some films we, we wish we had shown. And <laughs> they either came to us too late or we mistakenly rejected them and then won an Oscar. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we have some of the programs we're testing. We're, playing, we're doing one soon called uh, DC Shorts Laughs, which is a combination of stand-up comics. We're working with Funniest Feds to provide some of the, the best talent in DC, interspersed with films. And then we have pasties and popcorn. We, we're trying to do more and more things, as well as we recently simplified our other offerings. So we have a month-long, seven-weekend class called uh, Mentors, which is been hugely successful. We expected like 20, 30 people to show up and we're having 60 per class. It's incredible. Um, in which we, we have bring in professionals who talk about what they do in a day. And then, you know, people have hands-on exercises and they get to work with actors and they get to cast and they get to play with cameras and stuff that a lot of first-time filmmakers have never had the chance to do. Now they're getting the chance to do it under the supervision of people who are actually doing this for a living. So how are you able to keep all this focus on filmmakers and not spend all your time going after sponsorship and going after... Well, and, the, that's, and, that's the, and that's the catch-22. Right. So, you know, we're, do, we're doing it and hopefully we can make our budget based on the sales that we can do as opposed to going out to sponsors and asking for it. We do look for sponsors. Um, unfortunately, this is an economy in which sponsors are happy to give us unlimited beer and vodka, but <laughs> not necessarily cash. So we're yeah. trying to work within that. And, and that's, always, that's always difficult because you want to get Obviously, we'd love to get some big name sponsors in there to help pay out some stuff. But we also, you know, we work very lean. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of festivals that I consult with around the country that have huge budgets. And you're like, what do you pay? Oh, you have seven staff members that do what, like, one person at DC Shorts does. <laughs> so it's, you know, I'm, I'm, just trying, I'm trying to figure that out. We work, we work lean, we work mean, and, you know, we keep it efficient. All right, tell us about your book. Where did sure. you get the idea to, <laughs> to launch this book? Um, I was challenged to write the book, actually, from someone else. I have a dear friend of mine, Kelly Baker, the angry filmmaker, and he, you know, he's constantly writing books. And we were taking a road trip one year across country as he was doing his tour, and I was talking about festivals. And he's like, you need to write a book. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Um, and then last year, I finally got some funding for it. So I'm like, oh, I guess I'm going to write a book. Uh, so it, it's, you know, it's interviews with 16 filmmakers across the country about what they're thinking about when they're watching films, how they run their festivals, what their festivals are really about, the selection process. It's not just, for most festivals, it's not just about choosing the best film. It's the best film that fits their audience, that fits their theme, that works within the time constraints, and is available to them that week. There's, I mean, there's lots of, it's, it's an incredible formula. Um, and while doing the interviews, I was shocked at the answers I was getting from my colleagues. I, I, I realize that there's you know, 3,700 film festivals and 3,700 different ways of running a film festival. Then no one, there's no graduate program in how to run a festival. So everyone does it completely differently. And so just learning how everyone did it was, was fascinating to me. And when I released the book, the first you know, few hundred copies I sold all went to festival organizers who were just like, oh, this is how you guys do it? I had no idea. So it's fascinating. Now I, you know, it's selling a lot to film schools and a bunch of schools are picking up as textbooks next year, which is great. But, um, you know, filmmakers are, you know, calling me going, wow, I had no idea, you know, that, you know, I think filmmakers are so worried about minutiae and small things that they're not looking at the bigger picture. And I, and I think the biggest fault in what everyone 
almost everyone universally says in the book is, you have to, as a filmmaker, you have to see what else is out there. And if you're not going to film festivals and you're not watching new content online, you have no idea what you're competing against. And entering a film festival is a competition. You know, we get, DC Shorts gets 1,500 entries for 150 films. You know, that's not great odds. You know, Sundance gets 8,500 for 82 films. I mean, that's even worse odds. So unless you know what else is out there, you're going to make the same film someone else has made. So, How did you decide which of the different film festivals you were going to profile in your book? Uh, well, they're the first 16 that called me back. <laughs> so, um, no, there are, I wanted a variety of festival programmers, from people who did small uh, festivals like Razor Reel or uh, Scottsdale, to really large festivals like Seattle, Sundance, New York. I, I wanted a variety, because what's amazing is the problems everyone is seeing is across the board. It's not just small festivals are seeing these issues and big festivals are seeing that issue. Everyone's seeing the same problems. And for the most part, it's storytelling issues that, that everyone who has a camera thinks they can make a movie, but whether they should make a movie is a whole other issue. And everyone thinks, because I've got a camera, I, 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 I'm ready. But, Story, filmmaking is storytelling. It's visual storytelling. And unless you have a story to tell that's really well crafted, then you've got nothing. So where can people get a hold of this book? I know that if you're in film school, you can get it. Yes. Oh, it's, it's available on Amazon. It's behind the screens. Programmers reveal how festivals really work. Um, yeah, it's available on Amazon. The Kindle version's there, too. It's not expensive. And it, it's probably less than the cost of an entry fee to a festival. And you probably will learn something that will save you more money in the future. Are you having any local book signings where uh, people can come out and meet you? I had one. Um, I, have, I just came back from LA where I did a bunch of uh, gigs, and I'm off to New York to do some more, and I have more planned. Um, I know I have one in the next few weeks in DC, and just you know, check my website, and it will always all be there. But you are always going to come back to DC. <laughs> I, yes, I, yes, yeah. This last trip to LA, everyone's like, you moving out here? And I'm like, the weather's gorgeous. No, I'm not moving out here. <laughs> you hear that, LA? We are keeping him. He is ours. <laughs> well, thank you very much for spending your afternoon with Indy Capital. We appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for having me. And you can check out John's book on Amazon or on his website, real, R-E-E-L, plan.com. For Indy Capital, I'm Pamela Nash, and this was John Gann. John, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.